from Colorado. Uh, I'm talking to you from Colorado, where uh, in uh, the next time a total solar eclipse will go over my house in Boulder will be on July 22nd of 2772. So that gives you a sense of how unusual it is to have a total solar eclipse come to you. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, my plan for today is to uh, give you some background on my book, how I came to write it, what's in it. Uh, and then if we have any people have questions about the book, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and then I thought I would transition separately to what's going to happen on April 8th to try to give you a heads up about uh, what you hopefully will get to see if the weather cooperates on April 8th, which is a truly amazing experience. So um, I am um, I'm a science writer, a journalist, an author, and an avid eclipse chaser. I have seen eight total solar eclipses on five continents at this point. Uh, I am so fanatical that last April, I went to Australia, to the far northwest corner of Australia, uh, to see a total eclipse that lasted 56 seconds, and it was worth it. <clears throat> as I think you'll experience on April 8th. So how this all came about um, was actually this, so the story goes back 30 years ago. And at that time in the 1990s, I was a science correspondent for NPR. And in 1994, there was a solar eclipse, a partial solar eclipse that was set to cross the country. And I was assigned to do a story about it for the radio. Um, so I got in touch with an astronomer, his name is Jay Pasikoff. He taught at Williams College in Massachusetts, and he was, uh, crazy about total eclipses because he actually was a solar astronomer. He studied the sun. And um, I interviewed him for this story and he emphasized, uh, he, he told me how, you know, how to view the eclipse that was coming up and uh, what was going to happen. But he said, as interesting as this partial solar eclipse was going to be, a much rarer total solar eclipse is completely different. Uh, in a total eclipse, for all of usually two or three minutes, the moon completely blocks the face of the sun, creating what he described as the most awe-inspiring spectacle in all of nature. And at the end of the interview, he said something I'll never forget. He turned to me and he said, you know, before you die, you owe it to yourself to experience a total solar eclipse. And he said it with such passion and such sincerity that I took him seriously. So I started to do some research. Now, uh, the, the first thing I learned was if you wait for an eclipse, total eclipse to come to you, you are probably going to be waiting a long time. Any given point on Earth experiences a total solar eclipse about once every 400 years. But if you're willing to travel, you don't have to wait that long. And I found that a few years later in 1998, a total eclipse was going to cross the Caribbean. Now, a total eclipse is visible only along a narrow path, about 100 miles wide, and that's where the moon's shadow falls. It's called the Path of Totality. And in February 1998, the Path of Totality was going to cross Aruba. So I thought, well, February, Aruba, sounded like a fun place to go anyway. So I went there to experience the sun and to see what would happen when the sun briefly went away. Uh, so the day of the eclipse, um, I was out behind the Hyatt Regency on the beach with a whole swarm of people waiting for the show to begin. And we wore eclipse glasses like the ones the library is giving away that have really dark lenses that enable you to look at the sun safely. And uh, a total eclipse begins as a partial eclipse, as the moon very slowly makes its way across the sun. So through these eclipse glasses, we could see First, uh, it looked like a tiny notch had been taken out of the side of the sun. And then that notch grew larger and larger as the moon moved across uh, the sun, uh, eventually turning the sun into a crescent. And it was all very interesting, but I wouldn't say it was spectacular. I mean, if the day remained bright, and if I hadn't been told that there was an eclipse happening overhead, I wouldn't have noticed anything unusual. Well, about 10 minutes before the total solar eclipse began, weird things started to happen. So here I am on this tropical beach and a cool wind starts to blow. And 
colors started to look strange. Daylight was just off. Colors were strange. Uh, the shadows became really odd. They were bizarrely sharp, like someone had turned up the contrast knob on TV. And then, and then I was looking offshore and I noticed I could see running lights on boats. So clearly it was getting dark, although I hadn't realized it. Well, soon it was obvious it was getting dark. It almost felt like my eyesight was failing. And then all of a sudden, the lights went out. <laughs> and at that, a cheer erupted from the beach. And I took off my eclipse glasses because now, at the moment that, that it became a total eclipse, it was safe to look at the sun with the naked eye. And I looked up in the sky, and I was just dumbfounded. <laughs> so uh, when all this was happening, I was I was in my mid-30s, um, old enough to know what the sky looks like. But this, this was a sky like from another planet. This was a totally alien sky. Uh, first were the colors. Up above, it was a, kind of a deep purple gray, like twilight. While on the horizon, it was orange, like sunset, all around me, 360 degrees. And up above, in that twilight, bright stars and planets had come out. So I could see Jupiter and Mercury and Venus, and the planets were all lined up. And there, <laughs> among the planets, was this thing, this glorious, bewildering thing that looked like a wreath woven out of silvery thread, and it just hung out there in space, shimmering. Now, that was the sun's outer atmosphere, the solar corona. And if you've seen pictures of it, pictures just don't do it justice. It's not just some halo or ring that you see around the dark moon at a total eclipse. It's finely textured, like it's made out of strands of silk. And although it looked nothing like the sun, of course, I knew that's what it was. So there was the sun, and there were the planets. <laughs> and I could see how the planets revolve around the sun. I was looking at our solar system, like I, I was looking at some diagram from a high school science text, or like I had left the Earth and I was outside the solar system looking back. And I just, for the first time in my life, felt viscerally connected to the universe in all of its immensity. It was, it was, I dare say, a spiritual experience. And I'm not a spiritual person. I'm a science guy. Uh, but it was everything Jay Paskoff said and more. And it lasted for all of 174 seconds, less than three minutes. And as quickly as it started, that's how fast it was over. All of a sudden, the sunlight returned, the blue sky was back, the stars and the planets and the corona were gone. I felt like I had just spent three minutes in some other universe, and I suddenly had returned to reality. Well, that's what turned me into an eclipse chaser. It was such a spectacular experience. I just wanted to have it again. Um, but also, uh, beyond what it did for me personally. Professionally, as a science writer, I thought, I want to write about this. I want to bring the excitement of total eclipses to others. I wanted to write a book. Uh, but I also knew that if I was going to write a book for the, an American audience, I should wait a while. Again, this was 1998. The next total eclipse that would visit the United States wouldn't be until 2017. And then there'd be another in 2024. So I figured I should write a book to come out uh, in 2017. So this was a 19-year project. And as a science writer, um, you know, I like, I, I don't write dense, um, really technical kind of prose. My goal is to bring the excitement of science to the general public. And I find the best way to do that is with storytelling, is to find, and so I started to look around for a really good eclipse story to tell. And uh I realized that the best eclipse stories aren't from the modern modern day, but they're from the 19th century. So let me see if I can get my slide to advance. There we go. You should now see a map. So this map shows 
the paths of all total solar eclipses from 1842 to 1893. Again, they snake across the globe. Um, and this was a particularly important period. Uh, this, this era, the late 19th century, has often been called the golden age of eclipse expeditions. Because back then, total solar eclipses weren't just interesting natural uh, phenomena to marvel at, but they were really important for science because scientists were just then starting to unravel the mysteries of the sun. What is this great ball of fire in the sky? What fuels its fires? And uh, there were certain studies of the sun they could only do during a total solar eclipse. Something that lasts usually three minutes occurs about once every 18 months somewhere on the planet, often someplace very hard to get to, but it was so important astronomers would put together these expeditions and head off with all their telescopes and spectroscopes and other equipment uh, to, to sit in the path of totality, hope that clouds didn't show up and frantically conduct their experiments. So I started to look around at the various eclipses in this era. Uh, in 1861, there was one that crossed uh, Thailand that was kind of interesting. 1870, there was one that went across the Mediterranean. 1871, there was one across India. And there were interesting stories about all this. Uh, but then I came to 1878, July 29th, 1878. And that time, the, the path of totality crossed the United States. And not just any part of the United States, but the Wild West. So this is the path of totality, ran from Montana territory down to Texas. Um, and it, so it was a fascinating place at a fascinating time. This was the beginning of the Gilded Age in America. The United States had just recently turned 100 years old. We were still a young country, but we were, we were becoming an economic powerhouse. But intellectually, Europe didn't take us very seriously. Europe was the place uh, that was considered the center of Western civilization. That's where respectable music and art and literature came from, and also science. Uh, but here was a chance for the United States to show Europe what we could do in science. We were having this important scientific event in our own backyard. And so it became a huge national undertaking for us to make the most of this eclipse. Uh, dozens of the era's scientists raced out to the Wild West for the event. Um, this is a, a group of astronomers in a gold mining town in the Rocky Mountains. They set up their telescopes on the roof of a, an old hotel. Well, it was a new hotel then, but that hotel still exists in a place called Central City. Um, a lot of astronomers ended up going to Denver. Uh, this is a group from Princeton that camped out for a month for the eclipse. Uh, others went to Wyoming, um, and uh, which was a convenient place to go because the Transcontinental Railroad went, went right across there. So there were, again, uh, many dozens of these uh, astronomers and other scientists who came west. And so I started to make a list of them. Who were these people? Uh, why did they come out for the eclipse? What were they trying to achieve? What did they achieve to find some good characters that I could weave a tale around? And I ended up focusing on three. Uh, the first one is on the right side of this photo. And if we zoom in, uh, that young guy uh, holding a hat in his hand, uh, that is Thomas Edison. Uh, Thomas Edison in 1878 was 31 years old, uh, but he was already a global celebrity uh, for a recent invention, and that was the phonograph. Um, uh, but at this stage of his life, he didn't just think of himself as a, a, an inventor. He wanted to prove himself a scientist. He wanted to show that he, he could be taken seriously as someone who was out to, to solve the, the great mysteries of nature. And so he came out for the eclipse with a new device that he had invented specifically to study the eclipsed sun. And that was this thing called the tesimeter, which was an incredibly sensitive heat detector that he was going to point at the solar corona. That's what we know is the sun's outer atmosphere today. Back then, no one knew what it was. It was just this beautiful thing that appeared during a total eclipse. And he was going to see if it gave off heat as well as light. 
Well, uh, the second person I decided to focus on uh, was also in Wyoming with Edison. Uh, and that's this large fellow here. His name uh, was James Craig Watson. And Watson was an astronomer at the University of Michigan. Uh, he uh, came out west specifically to discover a new planet. Now, if you look at a solar system chart from that era and you zoom in toward the sun, you'll see that between Mercury and the Sun, there's another planet called Vulcan. Now, Vulcan, before it ever showed up on Star Trek, uh, was that thought to be a real planet. It was a hypothetical planet, though. Astronomers thought it had to exist because Mercury's orbit didn't make sense otherwise. Mercury behaved as if there was some mass between it and the sun that was tugging it along. Now, no one had ever reliably seen Vulcan, but that's not a surprise. It's so close to the sun that it wouldn't be in the sky at night, and you can't see it in the daytime because it would be lost in the sun's glare. About the only time you might catch a glimpse of Vulcan would be during a total solar eclipse, when the moon blocked the bright face of the sun, and you could actually look at what is right around the sun. So James Craig Watson went out to Wyoming uh, intent on finding Vulcan and reaping the glory that would come from discovering a whole new world in the solar system. Now, the third scientist I decided to focus on came out west with very different intent. And her name was Mariah Mitchell. Now, Mariah Mitchell was by far the most famous female scientist in America in the 19th century. She uh, at, was an astronomer and she taught at Vassar College in New York State, which at the time was a new all women's college. And this was a time when women's higher education was coming under attack because a few years earlier in 1873, a prominent Boston doctor had written a book claiming that this experiment in women's education was a risky, dangerous undertaking. That higher education for women, he claimed, was bad for a woman's health. <laughs> he argued, and I know it sounds crazy today, that if a young woman used her brain too much, she would sap energy from her uh, reproductive organs, turning her into a sterile, masculine invalid. Well, Mariah Mitchell thought this was ridiculous. She encouraged her students to use their brains in her astronomy courses at Vassar. Uh, but she needed to convince the American public that this book was crazy. And so in 1878, when groups of men were assembling eclipse expeditions to Texas and Colorado and Wyoming, she put together an all-female expedition to Denver. And so this is the Vassar College Eclipse Party in Denver. There's Mariah Mitchell on the left, uh, her sister Phoebe's in the background, and they were joined by uh, several recent Vassar graduates. And this was a scientific expedition, but it was more than that. It was kind of a, um, a bit of political theater to, to prove to the American public that women could be smart and educated and um, healthy and feminine to boot. So these three scientists of mine had something on the line. And the whole eclipse was really a kind of competition as the US was trying to prove to Europe uh, that it should be taken seriously uh, as a scientific, uh, eventually a scientific power. So uh, I just had so much fun writing this book because it just had this natural uh, built-in drama of all of these folks racing out to the West for an event that was going to last three minutes and they all had to get their equipment ready and hope that the the weather was going to cooperate and then frantically um, conduct their experiments and hope that everything worked out all right uh, so uh, in the end it was a beautiful day for an eclipse so I had uh, you know did my research in a lot of archives in fact at the National Archives in Washington at the Library of Congress at Vassar and had a great fun digging up old documents, including original artwork of the eclipse. 
So this is a watercolor of the total eclipse of 1878 as seen from Denver. Uh, there's this pastel as well. Uh, this was uh, done by a, a British amateur astronomer who was in Colorado. And, uh, and this was the view that was uh, from the top of Pikes Peak in Colorado at 14,000 feet, where some particularly hardy uh, scientists braved snowstorms in July and severe altitude sickness, but had just a spectacular view of the eclipse on that day. Um, so uh, I think I'll stop the story there because I don't want to give too much away for those who haven't finished reading the book or maybe haven't even started. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to answer questions about the eclipse of 1878, if you have any. And then again, I've, I have more slides to show to tell you what to expect on April 8th. So again, if you've got questions about my book, happy to take them now or I can just keep going. I definitely have a couple questions. If anybody else has any, if they want to put them in the chat, I would be more than happy to um, ask David your questions that you have. Um, I personally, I love the book. And I even told Kelly before I started it, I was like, I have to flip through it and make sure it's not too scientific because I don't have a very scientific brain. Um, when I found out it was more about history than it was about science, I'm that's something I'm really fascinated about. And I love reading things that I don't know anything about. So I really enjoyed the book. Um, anybody that likes history would like it, even if you don't have necessarily a science or math brain. Um, so one of my questions I had was, if is there a part of this story that you did not get to include in the book or that you had to cut that you wish that you could have included, but you couldn't because you can't just make it like a 9 million page book. <laughs> yeah, there was, I mean, so much that didn't go into this book, but there were some characters I wish I could have included. Particularly, um, uh, there was an astronomer from, uh, from Massachusetts named David Todd, who was in his early 20s, and he ended up going to Texas for the eclipse. Uh, and he was, uh, at the time, dating the woman who would become his wife named Mabel, and they were sending love letters to each other back and forth. He was sending them from Texas. She was sending them from Washington, D.C., where she was. I mean, to the point where uh, David, on his way back from Texas, stopped in a place called Mabel Vale, Arkansas, just because he loved Mabel so much, he had to stop there and tell her how much he loved her. And they were just these really colorful characters um, who who went on, Mabel Loomis Todd, so Mabel, after she met uh, married him, became Mabel Loomis Todd, is a quite a famous person in literary history. She, um, she is the person responsible for bringing Emily Dickinson's poetry to the public. She ended up be being a neighbor of Emily Dickinson's in Amherst, and after Emily died, Mabel uh, edited and published the um, the, the poetry. And Mabel famously, again, this doesn't belong in an eclipse book, <laughs> Mabel famously had this torrid affair with Emily Dickinson's brother, who was married, and of course she was married too. But there's just a great story about them. But I'm happy to say that actually David and Mabel, even though they don't end up, they didn't end up in this book, they are important characters in a book I just finished that's going to be coming out next year which is actually about another book of the history of astronomy, but it's a story about Mars and Martians, because at the turn of the last century, around 1900, there were astronomers, including David Todd, who convinced themselves that Mars really was inhabited by an intelligent civilization and uh, got the public excited about the reality they thought of Martians. And uh, by 1907, you could open the New York Times and read in all seriousness about the civilization on Mars and attempt to communicate with them. And before Martians were important in science fiction, they were thought to be science fact. So this is a very long answer to your question. But David and Mabel Todd didn't make it into this book, but they will be in my next book, which will be out next year. Yay, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad but, also, that. but Sarah, and I really appreciate what you say about but my book really being as much, if not more, a history book than a science book, because that was intentional. That um, a, a total eclipse 
it's not it's not about the science it's about the human experience of it and i wanted to find a way to reach audiences that don't think they're interested in science but but i tell you will be interested in eclipses certainly total eclipses i definitely got that from it because i'm not going to lie after the partial eclipse when everybody started making such a big deal about this eclipse i was like we just did this like why is the you know why yeah. is this such a big deal but I will say that the book has really got me more excited. And I mean, all of our programming that we're doing and everything as well. So I'm I'm super excited for it now. Um, we do have um, a question from Catherine. She says, have you considered writing another book covering the history and stories in America after the 2017 eclipse and next month's eclipse? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, so what I will say is, so my book, American Eclipse, was first published in June of 2017. And that was intentional. It came out a couple months before the total eclipse across the US on August 21st of that year. Um, my book has just been re-released three weeks ago, but it's a new edition. So if anyone's interested in getting the book, the new edition at the top, it says with a new afterword. So the book's been reissued, but it has at the end uh, basically, it's a personal essay that I wrote about the 2017 eclipse and about, I mean, because that was also an important event in our history. If, you, if you'll recall, I mean, it kind of felt like our country was falling apart. We had so many protests, you know, people shouting at each other. Uh, it, a week before the eclipse that summer was that uh, white supremacist rally in Charlottesville that ended up being deadly. Um it just felt like we were on the verge of a civil war. And um, and yet on that day, the whole country came together for something that was completely apolitical. You had folks from blue America going to red America. You had New Yorkers going to Tennessee. You had folks from, um, from Denver going up to Wyoming and everyone getting along and just appreciating being alive on this planet and what we share. And um, so that's, it's what I write in my afterward is, I, th I think said more eloquently than that, but that's sort of the gist of it. I do write about, about that. I don't currently have plans to write a whole book about that, uh, but who knows, maybe after 20, after this year's eclipse, I'll have to write a new afterward for my book to be republished in 2045, <laughs> which is the next big eclipse that'll cross the US. Um. One of my other questions was, what was the most difficult part about writing this book and what was your favorite part to write and why? Hmm. Well, I would say, you know, in some ways it might be, maybe it's both of the same. Sometimes it's the hardest thing that in the end, I don't know if it's the most fun, but it's the thing I'm most proud of. The... Um, Maybe I'll, I'll read one paragraph to you because um, the hardest paragraph to write was to describe the onset of totality in 1878. If you talk to anyone who has seen a total solar eclipse before and you ask them to describe it, nine times out of the 10, they will tell you it's indescribable. There's just no way to describe it because words don't do it justice. But I'm a writer, I didn't have that, I, I couldn't say that. I had to find a way to bring it to life. And so th this is, this took me forever to write. It's not very long, but this is how I describe the onset of totality in 1878. A total eclipse is a primal transcendent experience. The shutting off of the sun does not bring utter darkness it is more like falling through a trap door into a dimly lit, unrecognizable reality. The sky is not the sky of the earth, neither the star-filled dome of night nor the immersive blue of daylight, but an ashen ceiling of slate. A few bright stars and planets shine familiarly like memories from a distant childhood, but the most prominent object is thoroughly foreign. You may know intellectually that it is both the sun and moon, yet it looks like neither. It is an ebony pupil surrounded by a pearly iris. 
It is the eye of the cosmos. So that's my best attempt through words on a page to describe what it's like. And uh, again, I mean, I, I'm happy to move on to the other part of my presentation and then take more questions about both the 1878 eclipse and the April 8th one, if that makes sense. Um, one, My one question that I had that yeah. might kind of move into that part was, yeah, of course. where will you be ah. viewing this eclipse that was coming in April 2024? Right. So again, I, I live in Colorado, um, so I'm not on the path. I'm going to Texas. And uh partly because it's relatively close to Colorado, but also because choosing where to go along the entire path, Texas will have a longer total eclipse than anywhere else in the United States. It'll last as long as four and a half minutes in Texas. It's three and a half minutes by the time it gets to Maine. Uh, Indiana's right in the middle at about four minutes. Uh, also, the odds of clear skies are best in Texas. Uh, of course, odds are just odds. We don't know what the weather's going to be like anywhere on that day, uh, but you know, making a reservation a year in advance, Texas seemed to be the best place to go. And and also on top of that, I have a very, I have an unexpected and fun reason to go there, and that is, uh, if you can believe it, my book has actually been turned into a musical for the stage. This is something I never thought would happen, but. Um, these Broadway theater producers got in touch with me a few years ago. They thought there was a musical in this. I thought they're crazy, but sure, why not? See what happens. But they ended up working with a, a really talented composer, lyricist, who's had things on Broadway and off Broadway in New York. And he wrote the thing. And I went to see it, uh, a workshop production in New York, just a private production uh, a year ago, which I which was wonderful. And uh, it turns out that on April 7th of this year, I hope you can see that, uh, there's going to be the world premiere in Waco, Texas. That's April 7th, American Eclipse, the musical. It's uh, it's not going to be a full production, but there are going to be a bunch of Broadway stars coming down to sing. It'll be a concert performance of it. And this will be the first time the public gets to hear um this music. So I'm going to be in Waco with my entire family flying in from California and Maryland and Chicago, uh, both for the eclipse and for the musical. So that's where I'll be. It's, uh, it, I'm hoping for clear skies, but it should be just a, a really fun weekend. Um, so if you'd like, I can now tell you a bit about what's going to happen on April 8th. Uh, Okay, so just to, to, to give you a little background here, uh, so this is the path of the 1878 eclipse that I was that I write about in my book. This is the path of the eclipse in 2017 that went from Oregon to South Carolina, and this is the path on April 8th of this year. So again, it crosses Mexico, goes from Texas to Maine in the U.S., and then it crosses Maritime Canada, um, and. Uh, in 2017, as to zoom in on southern Indiana, Evansville was uh, just outside the path. I'm trying to rearrange my screen here. Okay, so uh, back in um, in 2017, you in Evansville, you had a 99% partial eclipse, which again sounds really good, but as I hope I've made clear now, a 99% partial eclipse is not a total eclipse. It's a very different experience. So this time, you guys uh, have hit the jackpot and are actually in the path. Uh, and in Evansville, on April 8th, uh, let me just okay, hold on. Okay, so just to show you, that's the shape of the moon's shadow uh, as it races overhead. Uh, so it's, it's, well, it's kind of an oval. And if you look at the path there, you can see you have to be in the path to get any total eclipse. Uh, if you're on that blue line in the middle, that's where the eclipse will last the longest. Um, because if you're on the center line of the eclipse path, uh, you're where the moon's shadow is widest, right? So 
uh, if, if the moon shadow, when it's racing overhead from southwest to northeast, um, if you're in the middle of the path, you're going to have the full thickness of the moon's shadow. As you get closer to the edge, you're not going to have the full shadow overhead. And so the moon, so the to total eclipse lasts a shorter time the closer you get to the edge. So Evansville, uh, which is toward the edge, edge you'll, you'll still see a little over three minutes. That's not bad. Uh, but if you were to drive north to Vincennes, uh, it'll last four minutes. But again, I should say a three-minute total eclipse is not bad. I mean, most total eclipses don't last that long. So let me talk about what you'll see in Evansville on April 8th, assuming the sky is clear. Uh, the first phase of the eclipse, the partial phase, will begin at 1245. Uh, and so that'll be a time to keep a careful eye on the sun using those eclipse glasses uh, and see who can spot that first little notch across the sun. And then slowly the notch will grow and grow and the sun will become a crescent. Now remember, through all of this, you must protect your eyes. It is not safe to look with the naked eye. But if you use eclipse glasses like the library is giving out, it is safe to look at uh, and you'll watch the sun continue to shrink. Now, as I told you about my experience in Aruba, for most of the partial eclipse, there really won't be much of a noticeable change in daylight. Um, but as we get to the later portions of the partial eclipse, around 145, it'll start feeling like something's up. Um, you, you may see birds acting strange, like dusk is coming on. The temperature will probably be noticeably dropping. Um, again, it's not safe to look with the naked eye, but you can use eclipse glasses. And also you can uh, enjoy this experience in other ways by making, for instance, a simple pinhole projector with a piece of cardboard to project the image of the crescent sun onto the ground. Or you can take advantage of natural uh, pinhole cameras, such as the spaces between leaves. If you look at the ground as the total eclipse is nearing, you'll see little crescents all over the ground, which are images of the crescent sun projected onto the ground. Uh, here's a bunch more projected across a driveway. And uh, really anything will, will work, including, say, a Ritz cracker. That's got tiny holes, so it will project little crescents. A really fun thing to take to, out to the eclipse, go into your kitchen and get a colander. Uh, because, I mean, like this colander here that I took out uh, to an eclipse, those holes are circles, but what you're seeing onto the projected on the ground are the crescent sun. And you'll, you'll see the crescent gets skinnier and skinnier too. So anyway, uh, as totality approaches, and a totality will occur in Evansville just after 1.02 p.m. As it approaches, uh, you'll really get the sense that something odd is about to happen. Uh, the, the hair might well stand up on the back of your neck. It just will feel wrong. Something's not happening. Something's not right. And again, look for the really sharp shadows as well that I mentioned. Uh, sometimes if you like if you have the sun shining and you see your head projected onto the ground, you can see individual hairs, the shadows of your hairs, the shadows have become that sharp. Uh, well, with perhaps a minute to go before totality, if you're lucky, you might be treated to a really odd spectacle. And that's ripples of light, like sunlight projected onto the bottom of a swimming pool that dance across the, the ground as sunlight dims. They're called sh uh, shadow bands, and they're often hard to spot. Um, but if you see them, uh, they're they're really they're really odd and wonderful. And now uh, at this point, we're almost to the moment of totality. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to subject you to one graph, and that is this. This shows uh, the uh, how sunlight dims as the total eclipse comes on. So. This, this is a logarithmic scale. This shows uh, that the daylight's drop by a factor of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million. Well, as so as the eclipse goes on from left to right, you'll see at a 90% partial eclipse, uh, daylight's drop by a factor of 10. A 99% partial eclipse by a factor of 100. But it's in those final seconds 
that the daylight just drops like it's going down a well. It all happens very suddenly. And uh, so I'm going to show you now one video. And this is me with some friends in Chile in 2019. And as the video starts, it's 30 seconds before uh, totality. And so watch how quickly the scene darkens. <laughs> There's Venus down there. <laughs> So, uh, what are we all looking at at this point? Well, we're looking at the solar corona. And um, again, this is the sun's outer atmosphere. It's made up of charged particles, superheated to over a million degrees, um, and that are being accelerated into space. And the shape of the corona is influenced by the sun's magnetic field. You'll see field lines like iron filings lined up by a bar magnet. And it's not some static structure. Uh, while you will not see it moving during those few minutes of totality, it is constantly changing. Uh, now, we now have spacecraft that can watch the corona 24 hours a day uh, by creating an artificial eclipse in space. So in the middle of this image, the sun has been blocked by a screen, and you're just seeing the outer corona. But I'm going to animate it, and in 30 seconds, you'll see what happens to the corona over the course of a month. So you'll see it looks like, like a wind coming off the sun. And in fact, that is what's called the solar wind. It's a stream of charged particles that passes by the Earth and causes, among other things, the northern lights. So anyway, as you can tell, the corona is always shifting. So it's different from one eclipse to the next. Uh, this was the corona in 1998. It had these elegant streamers coming off on the sides, on opposite sides of the sun. Uh, this was in 2019, pretty similar. On other occasions, it's more round or symmetrical. Like in 1999, it was looked like a sunflower. So... If we have clear skies for the eclipse, and it, you know, the, the main thing you'll be gaping at is the corona. But there are other things to look for, too. Uh, right along the edge of the sun, particularly at the very beginning and very end of totality, you'll see a bright crimson rim. This is the middle layer of the sun's atmosphere called the chromosphere, which glows an intense rose red due to hydrogen. And the hydrogen doesn't just confine itself to a simple band around the sun. It can leap off in what look, what look like tongues of flame called prominences like this. And mind you, these flame-like eruptions from the sun are larger than the Earth. They're just enormous. But don't just fixate on the corona and the prominences because there are other things to take in in this short amount of time. The sky itself will be bizarre. The color's amazing. I mentioned to you this 360 degree sunset effect. Be sure to look all around you and, and best to, to take in the eclipse in a big open field or on a rooftop, someplace where you have a, an expansive view of the sky. Uh, if the sky is clear, you'll also see planets. In fact, uh, this is a simulation of what the sky will look like during totality in Evansville. Uh, four planets and possibly five may be visible. The, the possible one is Mercury, which Maybe hard to see because it's so close to the sun; it may get lost in the in the corona. But uh, but Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn will all be in the sky during totality. Uh, and then at the very end of totality, the sun will reappear quickly, but not instantly. If you look carefully along the reappearing edge, first you'll see the red chromosphere, that that red edge, and then you may see some tiny dancing points of sunlight that come together in uh, sort of a shimmering necklace uh, like this. This is a depiction from the 19th century. So this is a time series going from left to right. 
uh, you'll see these beads of light that string together. They're In fact, they're called Bailey's beads after the British astronomer Francis Bailey, who in 1836 explained their cause, uh, which is they result from sunlight filtering through valleys on the edge of the moon. And as the, the first beads fuse together, uh, they look like a shimmering gem set in a silver band around the moon. And this is called the diamond ring for obvious reasons. Uh, but this lasts for just a fraction of a second. And at this point, the surface of the sun is visible, which means it's dangerous to look at with the naked eye. The sun has popped back out and it's time to put the eclipse glasses back on. So for me, the, the, the diamond ring is a dazzling and life-affirming uh, event. It's thrilling, but it's also bittersweet because it means um, that totality is over. It's like I'd been journeying through some fantasy world and suddenly I've been brought back to Earth. Uh, and usually at this point, people are crying and hugging and gasping and cheering. And if you ask folks why they're cheering and hugging, they'll say it's not only because of what they saw, but because of what they felt. The rush of emotion, the sense of awe and wonder can be overwhelming. A total solar eclipse truly is a transcendent experience. It feels unearthly. It transcends age and place and time. It connects us with each other, those of us living, and with people of the past. Witnessing a total solar eclipse is the same deeply human experience today that it was even 200 years ago, the folks in my book. And five weeks from today, you are extraordinarily lucky that it is coming to your own backyard. So again, I'm happy to answer questions about what to observe on April 8th, if you have any questions about that. Um, but I hope I at least have conveyed just what a remarkable, remarkable experience this is going to be. David, I did have a question. Um, sure. First, I just want to say thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and it's it really um, has made me even more excited for April 8th. Um, I was lucky enough back in 2017 that I actually drove um, south of Evansville and was in the path of totality in Kentucky around Madisonville. And it was an amazing experience. Um, and I... I can't believe that we are close enough. I mean, it will literally be in my own backyard this time around um, and we'll be in totality. So um, I, I have family coming in from out of town. I'm hosting people at my house um, that day and I'm super excited. What do I do if the weather is not cooperative? <laughs> what, is your, yeah. what is your advice? Have you ever traveled anywhere um, where there has not been you know, sunny, clear skies, and, and what kind of experience did you have then? Yeah. So, uh, again, I've seen eight total solar eclipses. I'm very fortunate that I've never been totally clouded out. But uh, in 2015, I went up to the Faroe Islands up in the North Atlantic near the Arctic Circle, a notoriously cloudy place. And uh, I figured my odds of seeing it were very low. The day of the eclipse, the weather was clearing. The question was, was it going to clear in time? Uh, it was cloudy during totality, but for three seconds, a hole opened up. <laughs> and I got to see it for three seconds, and I considered myself lucky for that. Um, I mean, there's no easy answer. I mean, the again, right now, all we have to go on are climate statistics. What's important is to start looking at the actual weather forecast like three days in advance. If it's really looking bad for Evansville and you really want to make sure you can take it in, you might decide to drive someplace else. But I, I've never, I mean, unless, it, but you just never know. I mean, it's what I, I have always stayed put. I've never, because, I mean, I suppose if it's, if it, if you know it's going to be cloudy where you are, and if you go a hundred miles, it's supposed to be clear, I would probably do that. But there, I know some people who will, who will, you know, it's partly cloudy and they'll get in their car and they'll kind of be chasing the sun. I mean, you could very easily get in your car, drive somewhere, get stuck in traffic, or drive in your car and find yourself under a cloud. And if you'd stayed home, it would have been better. A big part of 
you want the day to be fun and relaxing. And so unless it's a real obvious case of it's going to be awful where you are and great someplace if you go there, I would stay put and just enjoy it and cross your fingers. Um, you know, if you're under a complete bank of clouds, uh, the day is going to go from gray to black to gray. It'll be interesting, but it's not what you want. Um, so you'll have to go uh, go see another one. There's going to be one in the U.S. in 2044, another in 2045. But as I said, if you're willing to travel, there's one that's going to go to Spain in 2026, one in North Africa in 2027, a bunch in Australia. It's a lot, I mean, not cheap, obviously, but you can do it. But I'm confident it's going to be great weather everywhere along the eclipse path on April 8th. All right, we're getting, we've got about five more minutes. Um, I did, as you were speaking about it, um, looked up the copies because they have ordered new copies of the book for the library system. So if I would say probably within the next couple of weeks, we will have the copies with the new afterword in them. Um, oh, great. Uh, they're in processing right now. So they should be out pretty soon. Um, and then I just wanted to say, I know Kelly said, if you attended today, you do get a free pair of Eclipse glasses if you come into East Branch. If you have a library card, you get another free pair. So if you need um, someone for somebody else, then you can get one using your valid library card. And then we also have um, cool little booklets that have like all of our Eclipse programming that's coming up that are available for patrons at any of our branches. So. Right. Good for you for, yeah. for handing those out and for educating everybody. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been a really awesome chat. I'm so excited for your new book. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Th thanks for inviting me, and I wish you clear skies on April 8th. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thanks.